Starting archive with reallibertymedia.com, the road less traveled with Gary Allen to Gigi's Boo, and we'll add the rest of the stuff in later. So now the archive's running, and I can delete that out as we go along. I just had it sitting right up in front of me, and I didn't do it. Anyhow, that's what happens when you have too much time on your hands. Too much time. So, so what else is going on, Gigi's Boo? Anything fun? Well, everything's fun. Life itself's fun. I mean, you know, you have to make do with what you have, and it doesn't take it doesn't take much to make people happy. It really doesn't. I no. don't. It doesn't me. I think it might other people, but it doesn't me. And yeah. that's the story tonight. We're going to talk about frugality. Yes, you know, you know that we've gotten some boy. You know, that's a that's a loaded topic to me. Because it takes us right back to the whole creation of a fiat currency system, and the reason, the real reasons behind why that was done, and it has everything to do with accelerating development mm-hmm. and making things move faster and faster, and building bigger and bigger, and not having to be constrained by uh, time your wealth down to some to some um some uh, act, something that actually has value the value that is only increased by um, labor really labor and, and uh, so forth but you know you can get when you can get away from those restrictions you can just build as quickly and as as you want and in the process you throw the entire system out of whack you, you've uh, the, this whole since 1911 has thrown our entire social system worldwide, for the most part, completely out of balance. I mean, we have developed so rapidly, and especially technologically, rapidly, that our social systems haven't been allowed to develop along with it. So we're, we just weren't designed for that. It's like GMOs, in a way. You know, our body just wasn't designed to to work well with that stuff. And folks, I mean, it's, it's the simple, the simple of it, you know? The whole mm-hmm. simplicity of that. And everyone looks the other way. So we, so our assets are, are basically plundered, and you're given an IOU in the form of a Federal Reserve note that your labor is used to pay the the underwriters of that that's that in your real tangible labor has been used to fund this fiat currency and everybody just goes along with the program so mm. anyhow so we are talking about frugality we're getting us getting getting a little bit off track but well there was a day when people understood what was necessary to live and it was not just necessarily a day-to-day thing i mean there certainly was planning but there was there was labor there was there was effort there was reward there was risk and there was uh, inputs the family inputs basically as it started out in the agrarian way and there were certain rewards from that. And it wasn't just us. It was the entire local community that participated in these processes. Um, I had a little something to open up with. I think we'll skip that. Let's just go right into the uh, this whole thing since we since we ended up going there let's let's talk a little bit about this frugality Gigi's boo why don't you go ahead and cover that well i'm kind of the queen of frugality gary will tell you that i'm very very skimpish when it comes to money i don't buy things very often i did buy a good winter coat 
this year with uh, spent a little bit of money that I had I had worked and had made and and so uh, I was going to you know use it and Gary and I didn't want to buy the coat but Gary said you need a good coat so get it I have an everyday coat that I can wear around but I needed one for dress that um, you could wear to church or to social functions. Funny, we never go to social functions much, but we do go to church. So I got that, and I and I really, really, really hated that I had to spend that money. But if it's like my mother said, if you buy a good wool coat and you take care of it, you probably will be wearing that wool coat 15 years from now because I am not a label whore. I hate to put it that way. You've got... I've got a sister that is. She loves to shop. She loves money. And she stays in financial trouble all the time. Me, I don't do that. I, What I can't make, I'll buy at a thrift store or barter. There's very little money that, that changes our hands unless it's something that we really, really have to have. Gary and I do a lot of bartering. And uh, you'll find people this day and time, whether you believe it or not, that really enjoy bartering. And, and let me explain bartering to you how, uh, on our terms. If I see something that somebody has that I want, I can offer them what I can do. I can sew. I can crochet. Now, I'm not going to give her food away. I might barter making them some jam if they give me strawberries i might make them one case of jam if they give me enough strawberries we barter that's we do it that way bartering doesn't have to be of equal value say my stuff's a hundred you're gonna have to give me a hundred dollars worth back it's what is important to the other person and bartering is a good way to do and we barter a lot we cut a lot of our um monthly income um my father absolutely adores cable i detest cable so the first thing that went here was cable um i do not like mainstream tv i will not watch it it has nothing to offer me because i don't like cops and robbers and i don't like um the MTV shows and uh, all these other things that cable gives you. Uh, my house lives in New Jersey and all those screeching women and stuff. If I'm going to watch something, I want it to, to teach me something. So we have cut cable and actually we're going to save about 150 bucks a month because we went with Netflix and Hula and there's a lot of free channels out there. If you just go down with your Roku stick and just find them or your Amazon Fire, find them. And they're all free. There's lots of things that you can do. The other thing is um, I have found with our dogs that if I put in a few drops of apple cider vinegar um, in their drinking water, they don't scratch as much. And uh, the vet slipped and told me that if you would keep adding it that um, to about a teaspoon, that it w it's a natural flea repellent, and it keeps her coats healthy. And also to give them a good rinse in apple cider vinegar. Well, how many times have we women heard, rinse your hair in vinegar? It's good. It makes it shine. It's really good for you. Apple cider vinegar is a great medicine, like we said. Have it in your house at all times. Uh, it, it'll kill strep. It'll kill a lot of diseases. And it's if you can if you can get past the vinegary smell all the time. I even wipe my cabinets down and, and things down to uh, it deodorizes it and it also kills. A lot of the germs. 
Another thing that I do is I go over our bills with a fine tooth comb. When they come in, I look for anything on there that I don't know what it is. And like they'll sneak in these little hidden things on your telephone and all this other stuff. Just call them up. What's this? Why are you charging me this? Uh, they know how to rip you off. So question all bills, unusual bills. Another thing to uh, in the summertime is keep your blinds closed in the heat of the day. Uh, you stay cooler. Your air condition won't run as much in the wintertime. Open those blinds early every morning. Get that sunshine in. And it heats the room very well. Uh, you hear now of people that are always going to the gym. The gym's great. I just can't afford it. Uh, but you can exercise at home. And you can exercise if nothing but just uh, standing still and doing some steps, step side to side. If, you got, if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have a Treadmill, walk a treadmill. Um, get you some little hand weights. If you don't have hand weights, get you some a quart jar with some water in it and use those. Just work your arms. That's, that's a great way to exercise. Dancing is a great exercise, too. And that doesn't mean you have to be a great dancer. You can just dance if you have to dance by yourself. Um if you go to the doctor and you take medication, always ask for the generic brand. And if you can't even afford, if they if they don't have the generic brand, if you'll call the company, they might not give you but a couple of months. But if you explain the situation to them, most drug companies will uh, give you some extra uh, medicine free. Uh, they're going to push those medicines because they're going to want you to have them. And all you have to say is, I'm sorry, don't have the money to pay those big prices, so my doctor's going to have to look for something else. They'll send you some. Um, <clears throat> be sure that you uh, check with your insurance if you've got any and see if you can get them to um, cut the copay a little bit. One other thing that Garrigan and I do is we fill the car up. We keep the car full both cars, his car and mine, we keep it full of gas at all time because we never know when we're going to have to leave. And that's a whole different story with your bug out bags and everything like that. But make do with one trip. Um, say you've got to go to the grocery store to buy a few things. When you go to the grocery store, try to make your grocery store uh, running any errands that you have to do, uh, doctor's appointments, the whole thing. Make it in one trip. And that way you save on money, on gas. You, you can say, you'd be surprised at what you save on gas. Um, shop around for different insurances. Uh, see if you've got the best and it can't hurt to ask. Um, had one lady say, well, I'm not going to sit here and figure this insurance if you're not going to get it from me. And I said, well, I'm glad you told me that. I've got your name, so I'm going to tell everybody about you. And, boys, it, it changed. So don't be afraid to open up your mouth. You know, open up and give them a little argue. Um, hang your clothes outside if you can instead of using the dryer. Try try babysitting or being a handyman. Gary barters with wood. If you got a bike, ride your bike. Um, do as much uh, as you can, like with saving on your groceries. Don't buy name brand. Go with um, store brand. Now I'm a firm believer in Audi. And uh, the other one that's here now, I can't think of it. What is it, Gary? Lidl, isn't that the name? I think yeah, it is. Yeah, Lidl, L-I-D-L. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, check that grocery store for Markdown Meat. Anytime you go in, if you're a meat eater, check for Markdown Meat. 
You can buy the cheapest cut of meat if it's on sale, and you can cook it a certain way, and you can really get it tender. Like, I do a Swiss steak recipe. Well, you know, I get round steak. It's the cheapest and the toughest that you can get. And I cook it really, really slow for a long period of time, and it's very good. If you're if you're going to make a vegetable soup, I save all my vegetables that are left over, and then we have vegetable soup once every two weeks, whether it's hot or cold. And if you want to, um, if they run a, a sale on bread and stuff, be sure to buy two loaves and freeze one. Um, if you're going to hit different grocery stores, a very easy way to uh, insulate uh, something if you don't have a, a you know insulated bag is just get your two cardboard boxes, one larger than the other, and just put paper down between it and cover the top. And you'd be surprised at how well that will keep something frozen or something cold. Yeah, crumpled up newspapers in between. Yeah in between the two boxes and over the top. And you can always get those uh, sun shields. And so, you know what I'm talking about, Gary, the sun reflectors. Yeah, sure. You, buy, you can always put those over the top to hold the cold in. Um, if you can buy in bulk, sometimes it might be easier. Another thing um, that you could do, which I'm not going to do because I don't know, unless I know the person really, really well, is you can sort of do um, a monthly free, a monthly meal freezer plan and get a bunch of people together and say, you're doing it at your house, they're doing it theirs, and then you swap meals out. Well, that's a good idea, but I'm not going to eat anybody's food that I don't know how they didn't, if I'm not there watching it, and that's one of my sticklers. I'm not going to uh, do that. I've, I'm kind of funny. Um, also, um, your fruit. A lot of times people will buy fruit and they don't want to eat their bananas when they maybe turn a little dark. That's the best thing in the world you can do to make banana bread. So people will say, yeah, but I don't feel like making bread. Well, don't waste your bananas. Mash them up, put them in a container, freeze them. Then when you get ready to make bread, you've got them. Uh, also do that with your other uh, fruits and vegetables. If you have them, well, especially fruits, make them in the smoothies. Uh, if you got a blender, just blend them up with a little ice cube and you can drink them down. It's really, really good. Um, switch off the oven for the last five or ten minutes that you're cooking. Now, one year we tried and... Um, I fussed because I told Mama it wouldn't work. She put a turkey in one Thanksgiving, and she had preheated the oven for like an hour on 200 degrees, and she put that turkey in. She cut the oven off, and she sealed the door where none of us would open it, and the turkey was done the next day, and I couldn't believe it. Just overnight, the heat that it absorbed, it... uh, it cooked, and it was done, and it was good. Uh, you you sew uh, your beef stews and your hamburgers. If you've got a leftover, you can always put those with your lentils, and uh, oatmeal is always good in the morning to eat. It's really one of the best foods you can eat. Like I said, save all your vegetables to freeze. And I always go by a recipe and a meal plan. And it doesn't mean like you got to have spaghetti every Monday, uh, tuna casserole every Tuesday, but make you up about two to three, maybe four weeks of menus, and then you just rotate them out how you want to eat them. Sometimes you might not feel like spaghetti on a Monday night. You'd rather have it for the weekend, and you you can switch it around. But And when you go to the grocery store, be sure you have a grocery list. You'll have a tendency not uh, to overspend. Now, my grandparents always ate a big breakfast. 
then she cooked a large dinner and for supper they had leftovers so save your leftovers uh, we don't mind eating leftovers a lot of people do but we don't um keep your refrigerator clean and empty of free stuff that way it will not run constantly if it's clean and it's not got as much stuff piled in it um you can do your own vegetable garden. We've talked about that several times. Uh, you can barter again for your vegetables in the summer. And um, if you're working, this is a great tip. Be sure to take your, your coffee with you to work. And then again, like I said before, be sure that you do uh, generic items. If you can get whole chicken versus part, buy the whole chicken. Uh, stretch meals, make them go. Cook in the crock pot. Uh, add water, add your spices. Do everything uh, from scratch instead of buying. Next, next week, uh, I'll have a link for y'all to go to that I have a homemade mix. It's a standard mix that I keep mixed all the time. And it has my flour, my shortening cut in, uh, my baking powder, my bake, everything that, that you need, including the dry milk. So when I get ready to make biscuits, all I have to do is take three cups of that mix out, add enough water to it to make it as moist as I want it to pat my biscuits out, and they're done. You, you, it's so easy. I make my muffins that way. I make my banana bread that way, my orange bread. Another thing, if you like to drink tea, um, my advice is get you some different flavorings like strawberry, orange, whatever. Keep them in stock and add that a little bit to your tea. You know, iced tea is the wine of the South, and everybody down here drinks sweet tea pack your lunch and take it to work with you brown bag instead of eating out that's really a great great way to save money another thing that um that we do is your tube of uh toothpaste people will take a squeeze tube of toothpaste and throw it away. Not I, not I. Take you something and cut it. Take a knife and cut it. Open it up. You can brush your teeth with an empty tube of toothpaste. What's against the side and what you can't squeeze out for another two weeks. I tried it and it works. Um, body wash. If you think you've used it all, you haven't, put your little water in it and shake it up. You got one more, one more bath or one more shower out of that. And uh, my mother says, dear God, Brenna, you squeeze it to death. You're... But I do. I try to, uh, to, to, to take care, like I said, of the money wisely. You would be surprised at how much money you can save. And you can do the things you want to do. Now, like I said, Gary and I don't spend a lot of money. We don't intend to. But the money that we save, what we can do is we could take short trips. We like museums. We like free concerts. We'll even pay for a concert if it's not extremely high. We sit at the back, but we still, you know, we'll pay, we'll pay for that. And that's how we save our money. Another thing that I want to point out, I don't know how many of y'all actually save anything every week or every month or bi-weekly however you get paid but you need to save 15 percent of your gross income and that's something that i do religiously first when i get paid it goes straight into 15 percent goes straight into our savings account gary's the same way and you know how many times that something's happened, like car battery, uh, a tire, or something like that. If we hadn't had that money saved, 
we would have had to just kind of walk, I guess. And uh, it, it's kind of hard for people to get used to doing that. But if you can do it and do it at the first of the paycheck before you do anything else, as my uncle says, pay yourself first. And then you go from there. Okay, uh, I'm going to let Gary take over a few minutes. I got some background noise here that I can't hear, so I'm going to take care of that. Gary, can you take over a little bit? Yeah, I just wanted to point out, and thanks for that, all that cheesy smooth, <clears throat> yeah, the frugality thing is very important because we don't know where we're going to end up tomorrow. <laughs> you know, you don't know what, there's so, there's such a, you know, there's such a variety of events that could occur. Uh and they're they're not all they're not all necessarily um, man made, if you will, Michael man made even, <clears throat> but they could be something natural, natural events that we tend to overlook. We we live in a very dynamic world, a very in a very dynamic universe, so you don't know what's coming next. I think I just read an article today that they seem to think that about twelve thousand eight hundred years ago. There was a major um, event, <clears throat> celestial event, probably probably a comet or cometary fragments that slammed into the earth and set fires and threw the earth into a uh, basically an ice age. And if there if there was any advanced uh, advanced societies or civilizations during that period of time, that probably wiped them out. And so, you know, one of the one of the things I like to do is, is accumulate materials on um, catastrophism, and it's amazing when you start looking at the all the evidence of regular catastrophic events that have occurred in our history. And so, uh, <laughs> a resisting the temptation of the normalcy bias, one must. Uh, entertain the the idea that this isn't just you know something in the past. This is something that has been ongoing, and as far as we can tell, about three billion or so years the Earth has been around. This has been going on, off and on. So who knows? You don't know. You don't know what's coming next. It's also always good. It's always a good thing to to have some sort of preparations in mind. And not be so reliant, especially technologically. Imagine for a minute, as technologically reliant as we are today, imagine for a minute something that catastrophically took down the power grid, for example. Everything, all bets would be off at that point. You know, let's just think about that for a minute. You know, they talk about the day after. <laughs> that would not be a pretty picture. But anyway, without too much doom and gloom, it is something to keep in the back of your mind. And uh, Brenna actually found a couple of cookbooks online, or PDFs, that look really interesting, and you might have an interest in these. Uh, one of them is from 1918, and the other is from 1894. These are a collection of different recipes uh, that were, you know, using the materials of the day that could, obviously were available then, and would probably still be available if under the right uh, preparation conditions. So there are a bunch of a bunch of different uh, different things. Let's do the eighteen ninety. You you back, Gigi Spoo? Hello, you back? Yeah, I'm back. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, let me put a real um, quick in here about cooking and not having anything to cook with, uh, or the stove, or something's happened to the stove. Um, I had a college student tell me one time that they wanted a grilled cheese sandwich so bad they took the iron and they put uh, the cheese and the bread and everything together and laid uh, laid it on cloth and they put the iron on top. Then they flipped it and put it on the other side. And I thought, how ingenious can you be? That's that's a great thing to know. So you can you can cook with an iron. I meant to throw that in there the other just a little while ago but i just slipped my mind yeah that's okay you want to you want to talk about these two cookbooks that, that you found on uh well the cookbooks are um very good from what i saw of them uh they're like i said they're older and they're um you've got a lot of people who knew really how to um 
to make things go years ago. And what I what I couldn't couldn't get over was I saw in some how they uh, they made mayonnaise and they did uh, beverages and the bread making and, and all that. That was really hard. And I saw uh, something that came through. Um, some news feed, I believe, but it was the canteens that they set up for the soldiers, World War II, and one was in um, a little hole in the wall in Kansas. That train came through there, I think, twice a day, one going out and one coming back, and it carried nothing but soldiers. And how the women of that farming community got got together and had food and met that train at every time. Now, you got to remember, back then, things were rationed. And they managed to make one birthday cake for each train. For the, any soldier that was coming through on the train that might have a birthday that day or that week, They gave them the cake, and they all could enjoy it. It stopped long enough for them to come in, and they said these women were ingenious. They didn't have a Walmart to run to. All they had was a farm, and they made their own mayonnaise, popcorn balls, the whole nine yards. But these cookbooks, this 1918 Fannie Farmer cookbook is amazing, and and Gary's put the link up if you want to download it. You can, and it it gives you tips on uh, water and salt and uh, all other things and starch and uh, how to how to test the starch if it's okay and your sugar and and how to get your food ready and um, they they depended a lot on back then you didn't have the pectin that we've got now that we put in. Um, uh, jellies to make it gel. They had to use apple peelings because apples had a lot of pectin in it. It told you about their their uh, their poultry, their fish and meat, vegetables, all kind of things. And the salad dressings, if you get down there and read those, my Lord, it's just amazing what they did. And uh, really good. So, so jump in there and get both of those. Now, the other one was... Um, Wait a minute, let me think. It was, I believe it was called Foods That Won the War. I believe that's it. And it went back and it told them, now you got to remember, you, you see a lot of things in here that'll tell you to eat less wheat, meat, fats, and sugar, eat more corn. But you got to remember during World War II, there was no corn uh, GMOs. Everything was there. You you did. You could buy. Um, uh, people didn't have onions. They had a lot. They, you could buy onion juice. So they substituted onion juice for it. In fact, I've got some of that uh, that onion juice that I use. And the yeast and everything. And it was all done with, you know, by hand. I was so amazed at these women. Because here I am in a modern world and I do a lot of things that are not quite so modern but not quite as primitive as what these women and I got to take my hat off to these women they were some good strong women and um, they made their own cheese and I make a little cheese but just just read those and you'll really enjoy them and it'll tell you how to how to use everything I especially like the one that foods that would win the war and I liked it because that would have been around the time that my grandparents were there and they did all this and they did a lot of things sometimes without eggs and without milk and without a lot of things because they didn't have it so they used what they had they provided for their family and things were really good good if you want to you really want to know it it's really good back then to see the, the 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 good food that they ate simple filling 
uh, a lot of beans and rice. People could live off of beans and rice forever, and you could still live off of it. Um, there was one called an emergency biscuit. And you just took a cup of whole wheat flour and a cup of cornmeal and a little bit of fat and a little bit of baking soda and a cup of sour milk. Well, now, sour milk would be milk to them that was left over that did go sour. It wasn't quite buttermilk, but it was sour. And they just put a little salt in it, and they mixed it up, and they put it on the baking sheet, and you didn't go hungry. So I so admire women like that of that age. I told Gary many times I really wished I could have lived back then but I guess like everybody I'm a little bit spoiled but that's about it Gary go ahead and take over and talk a little bit yeah thanks for that and uh, just received word in the chat room Rob Rob Works says that unless you have a an account you can't download from Dropbox Dropbox. I've never known Um, that to be a case with anyone else Um, I mean we, 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 we typically uh, the other <clears throat> the other venture that we're involved with at Suspect Sky, when I do the editing and so forth on different things, it's always loaded either on Dropbox or Google Drive, and I've never had Oh, uh, Graham got it to work. Yeah, I've never had a problem. He said just click download and select direct download, and it download, downloaded go. for him. Okay, just double checking because I never had that problem. Uh, okay. Anyway. Yeah, the Rob for... works. Uh, Rob, uh, shoot Gary your email address, and we'll get it to you through an email address. Both of them, we'll drop it to you. Yeah, I mean it's it is a they're both PDFs. They're not they're not huge files, so they can be shared that way pretty easily. So okay, yeah, I don't know. I, nobody I nobody else I've dealt with has problem with that. I don't. I, whatever it happens. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, you're dealing with the internet, so it's hard to tell. Yeah. But anyway, uh, thanks for all that food stuff. I mean, that's important. You, you mentioned uh, beans and rice, and coincidentally, those are two things that store very well too. Yeah, they do. I don't even know what the maximum shelf life would be on dried beans and rice. I have no idea. It would be the only thing that you would require would be water. And, and, of course, if you like salt, you need that. And essentially, that'd be it. You would not need anything else because the the beans create the protein and the rice, of course, the carbs. And, you know, green vegetables are nice to have if you if you can grow them. The, the shelf life on those are not so hot. But, okay, good. I'm glad, it got, I'm glad you got it there, Rob Works. Um, got it. Did he get it? Yeah, excellent. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, very good. Glad you got it. That, I mean, that one that one cookbook's over seven hundred pages. So if you thought about printing it out, well, <laughs> well, still, it's uh, it'd be worth to print it out and put it in a in a binder. Sure. I do all my cookbooks that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. I'm just saying to be prepared because you have an ink an ink investment and a paper investment there because seven hundred and eighty four pages. I think one of them is. So yeah, it's. Uh, it's well worth it. I mean, keep it in a binder, and uh, if you really wanted to be safe with it, those sorts of those sorts of materials that you feel like are really, really important, you might want to put them in a plastic bag and seal them up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I say, you don't know. <clears throat> it's hard to tell. I mean, we take for granted every day, and you just never know what might happen. And it it's a sad it's a sad fact, but sometimes. Uh, after after the fact is way too late and i think that's that's unfortunately i believe is going to be the case in not too distant future but that's another story but what about things like you know weapons we people don't people typically steer away from talking about weapons too much for them because i guess the political correctness of all that and but why don't we talk a little bit about maintaining weapons Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things, and we don't have a lot of time, about 12 minutes, but I'm going to push a little bit longer because we didn't record it at all, but for the first couple minutes. But there are a couple of ways, you know, if you have a rusty weapon, and that's, I mean, rust is the enemy of weapons, typically. 
unless they're seracoded or something like that. But most people don't afford that. They have you know, their regular blued or browned even browned weapons. And rust is the enemy. And in a in an environment that might not be um, environmentally controlled, if you will, <laughs> in your your air conditioning and heating and so forth, that may not exist under typical standards. You might have to deal with the whole idea of rusty weapons, and that rust will overtake one in a, in a hurry. There are different ways of removing that rust. One way I found in an article in, uh, in the website Range 365, they call it the penny method of removing gun rust. And they use the word gun, I hate the word gun, because unless you're on a battleship or something like that, you probably don't have a gun. Uh, or in a tank, you might have a gun. Anyway, and it talks about the fact sometimes you can even find a really, really good deal on a on a real rusted up shotgun or something that you know someone doesn't want to put the time into to fix it up there are techniques that you can use to bring it back to life one of those is of course that penny technique I'm talking about basically put some oil on the metal and a pre-1982 penny now remember that you can't use the newer ones because the pre-1982 pennies were 95% copper and 5% zinc. Now I think they make them out of um, chewing gum wrappers or something. I'm not sure. But <laughs> but you put a little bit of light oil on there and you basically pick a spot and start uh, rubbing the penny onto the surface rust. And it will remove it without damaging the gun metal. Because the copper is softer than the gunmetal. Another technique that I've seen used, and I've actually used it myself, is is four aught steel wool. That's one, two, three, four, four zero steel wool, four aught steel wool, and there and your metal and your I'm sorry your oil again, and not not a heavy touch, not a too light touch, kind of a moderate touch. You can you can use that steel wool to remove superficial rust from a from a barrel without damaging the bluing so i actually did that on a couple of weapons and it worked fine so we'll drop this link into the chat room some of the, some of the things to keep in mind uh, about how to take care of those necessary accoutrements in a power down situation or a system down situation and uh, here's another article also and, uh, that talks about different methods. This guy has listed a bunch of different methods. and He, he names an oil. It's called Croyl, K-R-O-Y-L, which I've never heard of. But it's apparently a very high-end penetrating oil that you can that you can use and you can purchase it online it's not horribly expensive but this is something like if you have uh, a seriously rusted out barrel or something like that this is apparently something that works very, very well in that regard so there we go okay so there we have the, uh, the rust removal now, how about cleaning, just general everyday cleaning? Now, not everyone has um, a, a huge supply of Hoppy's gun cleaning solvent. Um, hops, if you like to pronounce it that way. That which I've always used, and I think it's awesome. I used to even sneak it into the military <laughs> and use it to clean rifles that way. And which... Uh, they never said anything, but of course they had their own contracts that, uh, for cleaning materials like CLP and things like that. But can't beat old Hoppus. But you can make your own gun solvent, and it's a lot easier than you think it might be. And essentially, uh, you just basically you find yourself an, an old gas can, you know, like a plastic gas can, one that you don't need anymore. Now get yourself uh, some automatic transmission fluid either 
uh, Dextron uh, 2E or 3 automatic transmission fluid. And you, you have a can full of that, set it aside. And now go get you a little bit of kerosene in the same size can. And make sure to try to find the low <clears throat> the low odor version. I think a lot of that you can get those in the, uh, that's lamp oil, right? Gigi's boot that you can get in the hardware stores. And that's the yeah. low, low, uh -huh. low yeah. odor version of kerosene. And another can of the same size, fill it full of al alpha fat, aliphatic <laughs> mineral spirits. Okay, and this is just odorless mineral spirits. So you have three, three cans, equal, equal size. You pour all those cans into the gas can and slosh it around a little bit, and you've just created basically your homemade gun solvent. Now, if you want to spice it up a little bit, you can add another can full of acetone and that, and that will help get rid of some of the plastic fouling that sometimes happens that gets jammed up into a shotgun so the acetone you can add that in equal measure as well so it basically tells you how to do it the article is pretty straightforward highly recommended to have your gun solvent around and you'd have a whole basically a whole gallon or half gallon or however you know size gas can that you that you end up using and there we go all right now this is one I have to add a disclaimer on to be very very careful with this one and you will attempt this at your own risk however this is an article that shows you how to make your own gunpowder the old-fashioned way in less than 30 minutes okay so push comes to shove you need to make gunpowder this article tells you how to do it the actual formula is 75 percent potassium nitrate 15 percent charcoal and 10 percent sulfur now one of the funny things that people wonder where you find sulfur charcoal is not so hard to figure out but sulfur is another story. One of the things I found out, and I, I never knew this until a couple of years ago, that if you ever seen Gigi Spoo, you ever seen all places in, in the woods where old houses were built years and years ago and the houses were basically gone, but nothing but the, the stone foundations remained? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you know that around the edges of those stone foundations you'll find sulfur usually? And for some reason, sulfur will... Uh, accumulate, I guess, f uh, there. For, uh, it could be some, I don't know exactly why. It could be an elect electro electrical phenomenon of some sort, but you'll find sulfur around many of those foundation stones. So if you ever, you know, look around, that is a potential source. Mm -hmm. And some of, this, some of the tools that you will need, a digital scale is nice, two glass or plastic mixing containers. Make sure you use glass... Do not use any ferrous or sparking material. Okay? That's why in muzzle loading, most of the stuff you see there is made out of brass. Because it takes, uh, it takes it's very difficult to make brass spark. Yeah, but don't use any kind of steel, iron, nothing like that. Because you don't want any sparks occurring while you're mixing gunpowder. And you have a plastic spoon, of course. A blunt object for smashing potassium nitrate and a small brass hammer is a thought. And a fine mesh sieve, sieve or sieve as some people might call it. And that's pretty much it. That gives you the technique and talks about eye protection and gloves and dust masks and all that good stuff. And to proceed with caution, <laughs> you're dealing with, the, with an explosive item here. And it takes you step by step by step in creating your own gunpowder. I think it would be particularly useful for those who have muzzle loaders. You might find it you might find it come in handy. If you're a reloader, well I guess you could. I mean today's modern ammunition is, the formula for it is quite different than than just this. But I suspect it would work in a pinch that you could reload. Uh, ammunition with this so anyway that uh, pretty much the two areas we promised we'd talk about and I guess 
we did get into it. And 758, what else you got to talk about, Gigi's Boo? Nothing right now, except I hope y'all have a real good week and don't get any of this bad stuff we've been getting. Yeah. How about with, how about before we go? So we have a little bit of time. I actually need to tear up a little extra time because of the late start, the false start. Yeah, five yard penalty. Repeat first down. Anyway, why did why did I say that? Anyway, did you you know you hear about robots all the time and artificial intelligence? But I tripped over this kind of humorous story, I guess. Pepper the robot was fired from a grocery store for not being up to the job. <laughs> so, you th- <laughs> so you think you think it's bad for the people out there now? Robots, robots have lives too, I guess. Robot lives matter. She was no, don't they? <laughs> was fired from the job. Yeah, and it came. Um, they they tried out um, Pepper the robot in a Scottish Scottish grocery store, and while uh, there was a documentary being made, Prepper or Pepper rather, the humanoid robot created by Japanese telecom giant SoftBank, was put to work in the grocery store for a week, helping customers with inquiries while at the same time attempting to offer some light entertainment. <laughs> Oh, and it talks about Pepper's background is uh, 120 centimeters tall. The robot can understand speech and respond with his own voice and also communicate via a torso-based tablet. A set of wheels allows it to move around, although admittedly stairs provide a little bit of a challenge. So at the grocery store, Pepper had a chair a chatbot, rather, created by a local university so he could have a relevant exchange with the customers. Initial reactions to Pepper or Fabio, as the staff began to call him, appears to be largely positive. They said he's just superb. And customers seemed both amused and curious about the latest addition to the store. All those, however... It became apparent that Fabio was limited in the way he could help customers, and his answers didn't seem that helpful. For example, when a woman asked where she could find the milk, Fabio says that it's in the fridge section, without explaining where the fridge section is, and without taking her there. The same thing happened when asked asked about wine, and Fabio said it's in the alcohol section. Hmm. And sometimes customers could get no response. So anyway, it just didn't work out so well for Fabio. And he admitted, and the store people admitted that they're going to miss Fabio. At the moment, we're looking for a robot to replace a human's job. But I'm going to miss him. I'm going to come to the shop looking for him, and he's not going to be here. Boo hoo. <laughs> So all is not so out of control yet, Gigi's boo. I know. <laughs> Poor it Fabio. don't look like it is, does it? Poor Fabio. You didn't make it. And here's, I think, the last thing we'll cover. This was left. This is the only thing left on the board, by the way. <laughs> An article from Idea Pod that says we are born creative geniuses, and the education system dumbs us down. And that's according to NASA. Dr. George Land dropped a bombshell when he told his audience about the shocking results of a creativity test that was developed by NASA, but subsequently used to test school children. NASA had contacted Dr. Land and Beth Jarman to develop this highly specialized test that would give them the means to effectively measure the creative potential of NASA's rocket scientists and engineers. The test turned out to be very successful for NASA's purposes, but the scientists were left with a few questions. Where exactly does creativity come from? Are some people born with it, or is it learned? Or does it come from our experience? So these are all very relevant questions. And uh, so they decided to give the test to 1,600 children between the ages of 4 and 5. What they found shocked them. This is a test that looks at the ability to come up with new, different, and innovative ideas to problems. 
What percentage of those children do you think fell in the genius category of imagination? A full 98%. But if that isn't interesting enough, it gets better. The scientists were so astonished that they decided to make it a longitudinal study and tested the children again five years later when they were 10 years old. The result? Only 30% of the children now fell in the genius category of imagination. When the kids were tested at 15 years, the figure had dropped to 12%. What about us adults? How many of us are still in contact with our creative genius after years of schooling. Sadly, only 2%. So what's the takeaway from all that? And it's not too hard to figure out, they say. School, as we plainly call it, is an institution that has historically been put in place to ultimately serve the wants of the ruling class, not the common people. In order for the so-called elite to maintain their lavish lifestyles of overt luxury, where they contribute the least but enjoy the most, they understand that children must be dumbed down and brainwashed to accept and even serve the rapacious system of artificial scarcity, unending exploitation, and incessant war. And that, was, that conclusion was reached by a fellow by the name of Gavin Nascimento, who wrote an article outlining all of this. So if you think, uh, you think there aren't people noticing how stupid people are and why they're that way, well, you might want to think again because it's out there. Anyway, I think that's about it for us t- tonight. Gigi's boo. What else you got to say? Nothing but to remember to always take the road less travel. And I love you all big to my heart. Have a wonderful week. That's right. Hope all you guys enjoyed the show. We had a good time. We always have a good time here with everybody at reallibertymedia.com. And don't forget to throw your dollars in. Come on, you four or five hundred people out there who are listening. Throw some dollars at reallibertymedia.com so they can continue to provide the service they have over the last ten years. Thanks again listening to The Road Less Travel and look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.